And welcome back, everybody, to Double Down with Breslow, where we cover everything related to the business of sports betting. Today, we've got an awesome guest with us. It is Bill Enright. He is a managing editor uh, for sports betting for Sports Illustrated. Bill, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Coming to us from North New Jersey, the hotbed of sports gambling, well, especially with the approval in New York and New York being up and running, you really are in the in the center of things. Uh, we've been covering New York a little bit. One of the issues coming out of there is the high tax rate that I know the companies are certainly complaining about. Have you followed that issue and to what extent that's impacting the, the expansion of sports betting in New York? I think a lot of operators have to be really strategic and, and model out what their projections will be um considering the high tax rate in in new york when you're when you're a licensed sportsbook operator yeah. I, i've seen a couple uh sportsbooks pull out a couple of uh applied initially and then decided that they weren't going to go through with it um it's no surprise they see the heavy hitters still operating there the DraftKings, the fan duels the mgms but it certainly is a very very high bar uh, you know barrier for entry given that that tax rate Yeah, it reminds me of a highly regulated industry. Anytime you have something highly regulated, it's a huge barrier to the small guys. And the big guys tend to like lots of regulations because even though it's costly, they're the only ones that can afford it. So here you've got a double whammy. You have a highly regulated industry, highly taxed. So the big guys probably love it. Yeah, and that's certainly keeping the small operators out of New York, which I think for the, I don't know, 13th month or 14th month in a row is the highest handle uh, for any state with legalized sports betting. Right. So the state is probably saying that, hey, guys, what are you complaining about? Look at your handle. Yeah, but the, the handle's not, you know, doesn't doesn't equal revenue all the time. Right. But the lawmakers are certainly getting their, some would argue, more than a fair share of of, of that handle. Yeah. And then other states, obviously, are going to be looking at it, both states that have already passed it and that haven't passed it yet to determine their tax rate. So if you're sitting there at a tax rate that's half that, I'm sure the legislature is saying, hmm, gee, New York's getting away with with, with double that. We ought to be looking at increasing it. Yeah, I don't know if that is the smartest approach for the uh, legislators, because it also will stifle a lot of the other smaller is a relative term, but it will stifle, uh, stifle a lot of the other operators from entering those states what we're expecting vermont here in the next couple of months and north carolina in the next couple of months uh, new jersey somewhere in the mid-teens for their tax rate um and it all varies on horse racing as different than casino and casino has different than sports book so um the legislators need to be smart if they're open for business and they want to have legalized sports betting um which i believe that every state should um, they need to be really smart with how they treat some of these sportsbook operators. Yeah. How do you analyze Florida? I mean, first of all, give us a, a little update on where Florida sits. We know it's kind of generally tied up in the courts, but also this very unique concept of the state giving one tribe a monopoly. Yes, Florida is very interesting. They're considered one of the remaining big three states, California, Texas, and Florida. Uh, but Florida has legalized sports betting now. It is only with this one tribe, uh, the Hard Rock Casino. I'm not sure if their digital presence is up live yet, but you can actually bet on sports at a physical location in one of their properties. And I think sooner rather than later, Florida will be one of those states that's added. The market will open up in Florida. It's just a matter of when, not if. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, my understanding is that the mobile element of it is still tied up in the courts. It's not live. And the issue is, you know, hey, these tribes are allowed to game on Indian land, but you'd be taking bets off of Indian land because obviously the person's on their phone sitting at home. But the, their argument is, well, yeah, but they're connecting with the servers that are on Indian land. And so that's cool. And that's the whole debate right now. Does that sound about right to you? Uh, if I'll take your word for it, it was my understanding that the sports book operators were trying to get licenses in Florida in addition to some of these tribal casino and, and operators. Um, oh, okay. DraftKings and a fan duel are actually siding with these tribal, uh, the, the, the tribal casinos because they want to piggyback off of their licenses. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, yeah. I mean, maybe the deal is that the Seminoles 
are just like in New Jersey, where if you've got a land-based license, you're allowed to partner with an, a sports betting entity, right? And that's, it was all based on the brick and mortar. In Florida, perhaps it's also based on, okay, you're a legal tribe in the state of Florida, able to game. And so you're able to issue out X number of licenses to sports betting companies. And th th that seems to be the same hang up too in California, where yeah. it was actually on the ballot, the voters voted on it, they voted it down. But that was part of the same kind of conflict in California where the tribal leaders were worried about their gaming licenses and some of these new operators coming in and just kind of not necessarily removing or pushing them out of business, but taking a lot of that market share that they already have established over the years in California. Yeah. The, the unique thing is, as far as I can tell, the deal in Florida only involves the Sunwall tribe. It doesn't involve any of the other smaller tribes. So that's pretty unique, but the Seminoles are dominant in Florida. You know, the other, to the extent there's other tribes, they're, they're much, much smaller. California had somewhat similar issue, except we don't have one dominant tribe, but we've got the big tribes and we've got the small tribes. And I think there's about, you know, some 25 of them roughly, but I don't know how, how closely you followed uh, California, but it was a disaster what happened in November. It was more money spent on this initiative than literally any initiative in the history of the United States. And they both failed despite that, because if you're sitting at home, like I was, all you saw was yes on this, no on this, or no on this and yes on this. And people just threw up their hands and voted no on, on both of them. But yeah, the, the, the tribes failed to get together because under one of the proposals, it would have given every one of the tribes a license. And so that would have put a small tribe on equal footing with a big tribe. And that's the last thing the big tribes wanted. So they wanted no on that. Even though it would have approved mobile sports betting in California for the first time, the big tribes were against it. And instead, all they wanted was land-based, uh, a land-based deal, which would have put them in far better position because they've got the bigger casinos. And that's what wrecked it for everybody. It's it's a sad state of affairs. I mean, if you are a person that's over 21 years old and you don't have, and if you cross the border and drive a few hours or maybe an hour for a while here in New Jersey, people were coming over from the train in New York City, placing a bet in New Jersey, hopping back on the train. The whole process took, you know, 20 minutes. So it, it seems silly these state line issues come up where people are really that determined. One, they'll go to a, an illegal bookmaker which is unregulated and and it could be dangerous. It could be you know, lead to violence. It could be lead to an enormous amount of debt. Whereas if you're gambling with a legal operator, um, there are certain protocols in place to prevent problem gambling. But when you don't have a regulated market, uh, that's where I feel like the problems arise the most. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's just, you know, most of these, I don't know about most, but, but the majority of states, I think, want it legal it's just the politics of getting it to be legal right and so that's what florida is still struggling with and california still struggling with texas being the other one of the big three i'm not convinced that they do want it legal i don't know have you followed texas much because texas is very much a non-gaming state in general i saw that one of the legis uh one of the state legislators put it out for i guess some kind of uh agenda item didn't really get much legs there at all uh there was a lot of opposition to it or um and it didn't really get past that point. I don't know if it was in their state Congress or state Senate, uh, but it didn't really get legs at all. And there was really no movement on it. Yeah. Yeah. They, they lose a lot of business to Oklahoma uh, as far as casino business, because Oklahoma has Indian casinos and Texas for the most part doesn't, and they don't seem to be bothered by it. So it's, like I said, Texas seems to be a pretty non-gaming state. So here in California, however, we've got, we, we, we can't place normal sports bets. But now we have something called prize picks that we're allowed to bet on. And I know one of your expertise has been on player props and you know betting per player or fantasy plays. I'm curious your assessment of prize picks, um, because even though it claims to be fantasy, you're betting against the house. You're basically taking two or three player props, picking a side, putting it together in a parlay and betting against the house. And they're calling that fantasy. Yeah, I think the betting against the house part is an innovative way to consider DFS or, or daily fantasy back in 2013 or whenever DraftKings FanDuel and all the other DFS operators came around, there was a big argument of game of skill or game of chance. And I'm still a proponent of the game of skill aspect of fantasy. 
whether it's DFS, whether it's choosing the player props correctly, I still consider that DFS daily fantasy. Um, just the prize picks and, and the underdogs of the world have taken it to a new level. And I think that should be kind of commended because it breeds innovation. Um, when now you're not playing head to head against maybe someone, a shark or someone, a really sharp player, you are betting against the house where it's, it's the same kind of payout across lines. So it doesn't matter if you're a novice or very experienced, um, that game of skill certainly comes into factor. It's just now, instead of taking, you know, you and I versus each other, you're playing against one central operator. Right. Right. But it does beg the question, how is it more skillful to, say how many passing yards Mahomes is going to have over under 270 versus will the Kansas city win by more than eight and a half points, <laughs> right? How, how, how is determining one any more skillful than the other? Uh, well, <laughs> I guess you'd have to take a look at my balance sheet because I crush it with player props, but betting against the spread is just something that I haven't had a lot of success doing. Um, there's certain research involved with both aspects, right? Um, people tend to gravitate. If you, have grown up playing fantasy sports like I have and we're in early the stages of, of DFS and now you're progressing to, to a prize picks. I, I do think there is certain research art, uh, research that can be done um, to help you succeed at a much, much stronger rate than if you're betting against a spread or betting on the over under or betting on the first half. Wow. That's, that's fascinating. Keep, keep going with that. T tell me, what it is that you're able to research in regards to a player, you know, compared to a team player. There's one, your individual uh, for a whole team. There's 11. So if I know that Patrick Mahomes is uh, having success on the road at night on the grass and all his receivers are healthy, I have a good feeling he's playing against a defense that struggles at gra on the grass at home at night. Um, that might not correlate to the Chiefs winning a game, but I can I can zero in on how that affects or impacts Patrick Mahomes and his playmakers. So, right, but theoretically, that's reflected then in the line that they provide you as far as you know passing yards for that. No, because yeah. the line also factors in the defense and the opposing offense and the opposing defense. So, um, with the player props, you're really just narrowing down on one particular player. Now, if you want to do more than one and and put them all together in a, in a group. That that's certainly some you know a parlay aspect to it, but for me, when I'm looking at player props, I can easily identify over and unders at a much. I have much more success doing that than when I'm picking a game, and I think that because when you're picking a game, there's just a lot more other facets involved. If a kicker misses a field goal or gets an extra point block, that doesn't necessarily have any effect on Patrick Mahomes hitting the over on his yardage prop but it might have a big effect on whether or not Kansas city covers that spread. Right. I guess my only counterpoint is that, you know, if Mahomes is, is playing a night game on, on, on turf against a weak defense and all those line up in his favor and everybody's healthy, doesn't that mean that the line is going to be higher? He's going to be over under 280 yards and where he's normally over under 265 yards. So the line should reflect that. So how are you getting an edge versus that line? Patrick, you you mean the individual aspect of the line, not, Correct. not the game spread. Exactly. The line on a total yards for Mahomes. Yep. And that's where it becomes um, uh, kind of like a market analysis, right? So you have to make sure that, okay, well, does that, was Patrick Mahomes last week at 249 and now all of a sudden he's 289. Well, that 40 yard increase, I don't think it, it's justified. And that's kind of an analysis that you might say, well, I'm going to stay away from that one. Right. Right. But bottom line for you personally, you've got a long history of doing well on player props. Sure. Yep. And does that continue to this day? I think I saw something in your profile that talked about you be, being on some win winning streak for X number of years, but but it stopped like in 20, 2020 or something. I want to make sure you're still on your hot streak. I'm still doing very well with my player props. I wish my against the spread and over under uh, bets will be doing well, but I am doing great for my best bets. I think my best bets are up to seven and two this year on the NFL, but it's just all these other bets that I've been doing that just have been dragging down that, that winning percentage down to like 50. And what is your, what, what's been your rough winning percentage on player props? 
Fire props have been hovering around 60% for a few years now. Uh, Don't they sometimes offer you um, there, there, there's more of a vig for the house on the player props instead of 110 to win 100, it's 115 or what have you? Not necessarily. You can get anytime touchdown props for Dalton Kincaid was plus seven, 175 on Monday night. Um, so it's all about finding value, right? I'm, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that people go out and bet on every single player prop imaginable. Yeah. You, but what yeah. I mean is let, let's say Mahomes is 270. Okay. If you want to bet the over, is it 110 to win a hundred? Is it 115 to win a hundred versus the other side? But Barry varies by sports book and you have to be judicious in finding the right line, just like any against the spread or over under bet. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you have to find the right line shop around because yeah. every little dollar, the VIG, the VIG comes into play. Uh, if you find one for 110, uh, that might be good for Patrick Mahomes. But Travis Kelsey, he might be minus 105 on another operator. So it, it's it's not as easy as staying on one app and clicking through. You have to be, if you're taking it seriously, there's casual people out there. God bless them. They stay on one app. They're loyal to that company. And they run through that list and they'll find the over-under, they'll find the same game parlay, they'll find the spread. But if you want to take it as serious as possible, you really need to shop around and do your due diligence on finding the best value. It's about the number, not just about the bet. Yeah. All right, cool. Let's keep the conversation going after this break. It's Bill Enright, Managing Editor of Sports Betting for Sports Illustrated. Be right back. We give game day a whole new meaning. Welcome back, everybody, to Double Down with Russell. We are speaking with Bill Enright, the managing editor for sports betting at SI, but we're focused on player props and fantasy, which is his expertise. Let's talk now. Uh, you be, we've been talking player props, but let's talk about traditional old school fantasy. Um, and it sounds like you've been in that space for a long time. And so that's always been about building a team. Historically, it was about building a team for the season. And then it kind of morphed into you know, uh, a, a single Sunday, but kind of w walk us through that, that history. Yeah. So if you go way back, the first fantasy leagues, I mean, there's discrepancies on this. A lot of people like to say I was in the first fantasy league ever. Uh, but the, yeah, as, does somebody get credited for inventing it, by the way? I believe there's a group of people in Matthew Barry's book, a fantasy life, which is a great read for everybody. I think he credits a group of people. I want to say they were in California specifically San Francisco, why that pops into my head. I don't know. It's been a while since I've read it, but there are people that have been identified as, as kind of the, and by the way, sorry to interrupt, but didn't, am I right that it started more with baseball than it did with football? Yeah, rotisserie baseball was really the way that rotisserie. That yeah. Started um, with people looking at the, you didn't have the internet. You didn't have live scoring. You didn't have every game on TV or uh, social media to give you updates you had to score your games and your players by using the newspaper and looking at the stats and calculating everything by hand. And um, well, and baseball is a great stats game and a, and a great individual, you know, performance uh, sport. So it, it makes sense that it would have started with, with baseball, frankly. Certainly is. Um, and I think the dawn of the internet changed a whole lot of everything about our way of life. And it certainly changed everything about fantasy sports when Yahoo and CBS and ESPN uh, started launching their fantasy products, people stopped having to use their newspapers and had the internet to score their matchups. And you had very close to real-time stats, or at least you knew your matchup if you won or lost uh, based on the scores uh, of that game, instead of waiting for a day or two days 
for your commissioner to write a letter and mail it out to the group and let everyone know the standings and the scores of the week. Right. So you had these season long leagues, right. Consisting of eight, 10, 12 teams, something like that. Yeah. Right. And, and then it was a matter of tracking the points. And so it became so popular that these websites are providing tools to track your teams whether there was betting going on or not, most of them probably did, but it was all just between the players. So that's not something that, you know, that the app was getting involved in. And and then you have what the birth next of of was it DraftKings or FanDuel that was first? I don't know which one was first. There was a lot of other ones. There was Star Street and Super Draft. And there's been a lot of different operators over the years that that kind of expanded the way that we think about fantasy sports or the traditional way that fantasy sports have been played. Um, which I think is great because now all of a sudden, hey, if I, you drafted Nick Chubb this year in your season long league and maybe you had a couple other players that got injured, well, now you can turn your, your attention to, to daily fantasy or you're playing simultaneously. There's D DFS games where you can play just for the Sunday night game or just for the Thursday night game, just players in the Monday night game or just players in the early slate of Sunday. So there's a lot of different aspects to playing daily fantasy. Daily base, daily, uh, excuse me, season long fantasy baseball has certainly kind of had a downward trend in popularity, but DFS for baseball is still very popular because instead of that season long, 160 games or whatever these, uh, the baseball uh, MLB plays, now maybe you just want to focus on one or two games a week and you can do that with daily fantasy. So certainly welcome that uh, continued innovation by some of these DFS operators because it's certain, it's been, it, it's been a fun journey, very exciting way to see how fantasy, the fantasy space has matured into a multi-billion dollar industry. And, you know, it's not just a group of guys playing anymore or a group of girls playing. If you go to your kid's softball game or your kid's baseball game, the dads and the moms and the coaches and the umpire, they're all talking fantasy sports. And I, I think that's a great thing. They're talking fantasy sports for Little League fantasy sports or are they talking about uh, professional at, sports? At, at your kid's baseball oh. game. You might hear a mom talking to the umpire about their fantasy, you know, their fantasy football team. Okay. You, you, you reminded me of a, a, a it was a, a very dark period for the Claremont little league uh, here in California. I, I was uh, the, the PA announcer. It was a little job I had while I was in high school being the PA announcer. And I used to put little bets on the games <laughs> on the little games with the umpire. We thought it was funny. And then some of the coaches heard about it and they thought it was funny and didn't think anything of it. But when you think about it, the umpire had a bet on the game, <laughs> but yeah. I'm talking about like a dollar or two. And it ended up becoming a scandal where like three umpires were fired and so on. I didn't lose my job as the PA announcer, but it, it's a very dark period in the Claremont little league. That's uh, not, not often spoken of. Uh, so tell me, do you still play fantasy sports then? Still play fantasy sports with some of the same people that I started playing with back in 1998. Some of them are still in my same league, and it, it, I play in a lot of industry leagues. We have a Sports Illustrated Invitational with every, you know, CBS and Yahoo's and ESPNs, and all of their analysts are on uh, a bunch of the leagues that I play in. And then different celebrities are in some of the leagues that I play in, and it's just it just goes to show. My point was about saying the little league and softball. It's just that it's not some strict NFL fan or, or MLB fan that's playing fantasy in general has expanded the landscape so much that even the most casual fan finds himself in a fantasy league. Yeah. For some reason, I feel like women actually kind of participate that probably in a higher percentage than regular sports betting. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of different um, female analysts or, or women analysts that uh, kind of had paved the way for other um or have increased the popularity among women uh, for to play fantasy sports. I think fantasy football is definitely more of a, um, in terms of the fantasy sports, NBA, MLB, NFL, fantasy football seems to be the most popular among women, yeah. uh, NBA being number two and then MLB number three. So how many season long leagues are you in? Uh, you know, I used to be in double digits. Oh my God. I really had to cut down a lot because it just, it, <laughs> isn't fun anymore to be playing Christian McCaffrey's on this team, but I'm playing against Christian McCaffrey over here and I need Brock Purdy to pass to Debo Samuel in this league, but not to George Kittle in this league. So I, I I've really cut back a lot. 
the invention of best ball leagues where you draft a team, you set it for the year, and you just forget it. The computer automatically puts in a starting lineup. Uh, those have become a lot more popular for people that play and find themselves in, in a ton of different fantasy leagues. So I'll do a few high stakes leagues a year, and then I'll do a few backyard leagues that I've mm-hmm. been playing with for the same friends since I've been in you know sixth, seventh, eighth grade. And then what about betting fantasy on DraftKings or FanDuel? Are you doing that? Yeah, I uh, I continually find myself gravitating toward um, NFL, college basketball. I stay away from college football until bowl season, and I won't bet on uh, on Major League Baseball at all. And when we talk about NFL, we're talking about daily. So it, it, you're just betting on one Sunday. No, I'll I'll have action on Monday, Thursday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Sunday afternoon. Right, but that. all the players are just playing on that one day. I'm not compared, I'm, compared to this compared to the season long, etc. You, you you know you. Oh, the, I still you play playing, Absolutely, yeah. yes, I love DraftKings. I love FanDuel. I'm more of a fifty fifty guy. That means you know fifty percent of the of the participants win money. I'm not always looking for that big million dollar big ticket win. Um, I I might throw a few lineups in those kind of contests, but I'm more of a slow and steady and methodical better uh, daily fantasy player over the course of the season. I'll come out on the positive end. So I, I like those 50, 50 contests. What, what, what give me an idea of what's probably, you know, the most lucrative pools that, that DraftKings or FanDuel are putting out there. What's the most popular ones that they're, that players are playing. And the most popular ones are definitely the, the millionaire makers, those $20 entry and you have the chance to win a million dollars. So you wake up on a Sunday morning, you might have $20 in your account. By the time the second set of games ends on Sunday, you could be a millionaire. And Those, that's, a, that's a guaranteed prize. Yeah, that's a guaranteed prize. They're called GPP's Guaranteed Prize Pool. Um, those, and that's all based on them just knowing historically that they'll, they'll get X number of betters so they can afford to offer the million-dollar prize. Yeah, you'll find you know 300,000 people in those kind of contests where maybe the top 1,000 or top 10,000 will get paid out. It's very top heavy though. So the first, second, third place might win 65% of the money or 75% of the total total prizes, which certainly has their it's a lore. It's certainly very enticing. It's just not the way that I like to use my funds to try to make money or 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 actually or or just enjoy my Sundays or or anything. Yeah. yeah, well, it's it's a little bit like playing the lottery. But, you know, in in the lottery, the house takes 50 percent. And I think DraftKings and FanDuel are probably taking a lot less. Right. Maybe more like 15 percent. Yeah, I, I, I think their rate increases slightly every year. So their rate nowadays might be around 14 percent. Uh huh. And how, how many players you, are you picking uh, on that to get that million dollar prize? Uh, one quarterback, two running backs, three wide receivers, a flex, a tight end and a defense. And anybody, and it's all, and you're given a certain amount of money to spend, right? Uh, 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 it, there's a there's a budget that you're given to pick those players with. Yeah, imaginary budget. So on DraftKings, it's fifty thousand dollars fake money, and then Patrick Mahomes might cost ten thousand dollars, and Travis Kelsey might cost eight thousand dollars, and you might find a diamond in the rough that only costs thirty eight hundred dollars. Um, and that's another where I think the skill factor comes into play, knowing how to set a lineup properly, balance a budget, find guys that are going to outperform their, their salary threshold. Um, And that's where, that's where the skill comes in. Yeah. Which is another thing that differentiates it from prize picks where prize picks, it really is just player props here. It's this budget that you're given to pick the players and so on. I mean, I was hearing uh, you could probably confirm this, that, you know, kind of at the same time that poker online poker became illegal in the U S fantasy sports was kind of booming. And a lot of these poker players migrated over to fantasy because it had some of the same elements where you had the sharks who really knew it and had the analytics and so on and could take advantage of your average, you know, player like me, who's just kind of doing it for fun. And these guys did extremely well. Yeah, game theory certainly uh, comes into play when you're talking about daily fantasy sports and uh, poker players are some of the best game theory analysts out there. So it was a really seamless transition for a lot of them that played poker, not just casually, like a, a, yeah. 
poker player that were making living or trying to make a living by playing poker online. Um, they carried a lot of that of, of that game theory over to daily fantasy. And a lot of them had some success very early on and still continue to have success. And just give me a quick insight or idea as to what they were seeing or analyzing that your average player was not. I think a lot of that had to do with uh, player percentages. So if, if the poker players, I'm generalizing, but yeah. good daily fantasy player will know, okay, well, Patrick Mahomes might have 48% ownership, or he might be on 48% of teams that are in this contest this week. Well, I don't really have an edge if he's on half the teams out there. Instead, I might want to use Joe Burrow, who's going to have less than 10% uh, on uh, less than 10% rostered uh, in this contest. And I'm going to therefore, you know, package him up with someone like Jamar Chase, who might be a little bit more popular, but not as popular as Mahomes and Kelsey stack. So I'm going to use Jamar Chase and I'm going to use Joe Burrow and I'm going to only have to beat out 10% of the field instead of playing in this other, you know, contest within the contest, 48% of the field that is riding with the Chiefs. Right. If Mahomes has a great day and you got Mahomes, you didn't really get a big advantage on everybody because everybody had Mahomes. Correct. And you're, and you're also, you're a, so you're able to put a top wide receiver with his quarterback because that's really doubling down on, on a duo, right? You can do it as much as you want. You can have your top quarterback with the running back with two wide receivers with the tight end and with the defense. Well, are you allowed? I thought you always had to hand, you couldn't have all your players be on one team, Not be nice. from one team. Well, it's, I, I don't want to say it's impossible to, but the salaries might have to match up where, let's take the Dallas Cowboys, for example. They just blew, scored 49 points against the Giants. The probably the best stack of the week was Dak Prescott, CD Lamb. Brandon Cooks, uh, Tony Pollard, not so much. Michael Gallup, not so much. Jake Ferguson had a decent game there, tight end. But if I just use Dak, Brandon Cooks, and C.D. Lamb, I am probably you know eighty five percent of the rest of the field that didn't use those three players because they were the top performing players at their positions for the week. But right. there's no there's no uh, restriction on on you have to you're only limited to use three Cowboy players. That, that no, but I'm but I'm pretty sure, especially if you're just betting on one game, um, it was what was the Cowboys versus Giants. You, you couldn't take only Cowboy players if it was only on that game. Yeah, you have to you have that. Well, if you're if you're betting, if you have a contest on a, a one game only, a one game slate, for example, Thursday night, right? Thursday night, Bengals and Ravens are playing. You have to have at least one Ravens player or at least one Bengals player on your roster, but that's only applies to the single game slates. Gotcha. Yeah. And that's all these kind of rules associated with fantasy that are somewhat made up. I think, I mean, I know that some States now regulate it, but again, this goes back to the prize fix thing of, is it legal or is it not? It's like how one person defines fantasy is not necessarily always the same as someone else. Well, it's definitely legal, right? They're operating in like 30 States right now. Right. Right. But if, if for some reason, I mean, but well, price picks is operating a bunch of states, too. Which one are you saying is definitely legal? Price picks. They're 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 a function. Well, no. Yeah. But they're being they're being challenged in a lot of those states. I don't know how closely you're following that. I'm following it very closely. I'm just okay. saying it's not a matter of that they're legal or illegal, illegal. They are legal. They are they're operating. They're functional. They're operating. It's yet to be determined whether they're operating legally. There's lots of companies that go out there and operate and then they're later shut down and they have to pay some big fines. It, it happened to some poker companies. <laughs> that, that, that may be the case, but you know, as we're talking right now, um, there, there hasn't, there, I think a few States have banned the prize picks on underdog Florida being one of them. Yeah. Well, and I think there's probably either is or going to be, you know, there's these private attorney general actions where some attorney, finds a bunch of people who lost money on the site and brings a case and says that, Hey, they lost money, but you guys are operating illegally and they want their money back, you know? So that's some of the challenging environment that's, that's out there and whether price picks is facing that, I don't know, but I know there's definitely some other companies that are, that are facing that. I used to live in the world of gray gaming. So I, so I know this area. Well, I mean, in gaming, there's lots of gray areas and uh, you know, um, my, my my company, we, we we put out something that helped Indian gaming become what it is today because we created a machine that looked and played like a, sh a slot machine 
but the court said was technically not a slot machine. And next thing you know, the tribes are putting these all in and the states are going, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and, and we, but we won in court and ultimately the, the tribe, the state said, well, if you're allowed to do that, we might as well let you put in full fledged slot machines, changed all their laws, let the slot machines out, but unfortunately pushed my machines out because all the big boys came in and replaced us. But it's, you, you, you need companies like that to kind of push the envelope and, you know, create the market. And that's, you know, arguably what Price Picks is doing. hundred percent on board with that. I, yeah. A capitalist at heart. <laughs> All right, Bill, we'll leave it there. Really appreciate your time. Would love to have you back. There's a lot of subjects that we didn't get to, including, well, let, let, let me hit one before, before we go. I just noticed my notes and I really wanted to ask you, you know, uh, fixing games. It's not talked that much about in the U S anymore. You know, we had the black Sox scandal back in the 1900 something, which a good movie was made about. And you have various betting scandals. that happens occasionally the NBA, uh, uh, referee, et cetera. But, you know, we've had this a humongous explosion of sports betting. All the leagues said that we don't want legal sports betting because it's going to jeopardize the integrity of the game. Now, suddenly they don't seem to be any concern about the integrity of the game, but yet we haven't had any big stories about any fixing, but when you've got all this focus now on, on players and that you can bet on a single player and bet quite a bit of money on a single player, you know, one player, it's kind of hard for him to throw a game. But to throw his own statistics and know that I'm at 87 receiving yards and all I got to do is drop the next pass and make sure I don't go over, that seems pretty fairly high high risk. What what do you what are your thoughts on that? There's a great uh, documentary I think it was on Netflix about Headache Smith, who was a point guard for the Arizona State Sun Devils back in the 90s. Um, that to that is probably the most recent example of a point shaving. Well, he wasn't point shaving. He was actually trying to hit the over um, scandal that that hit the especially college sports that that hit sports in general. Um, the most, right, that's, that's quite that's, that's quite some time ago. We're talking 30 years ago now. Most recently. Right. So, yeah, I do think it's inevitable. I think somewhere in the future along the lines, something will come out. Oh, another one. Uh, the the referee for uh, for the NBA who was. Yep. Uh, uh, he he was another person involved in 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 point shaving, so uh, or point, sports betting uh, scandal that was directly involved in in the facet of a game. I think it's inevitable that it's going to happen. What the leagues need to do is what they're is what they're doing already is by setting up these geo fences and 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 making sure that the players are not betting within the facility and within the sport that they play. So we saw the NFL hand out some pretty significant punishments. We've been talking a lot about Florida. It's 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 actually kind of ironic because Calvin Ridley, who was a, a wide receiver for the Falcons at the time, was had his bye week and he was in Florida and he bet on a game for like he was in Florida for the two week window that sports betting was open for on mobile apps two years ago. He ended up getting suspended for the year. Wow. Now play- I didn't hear that story. He yes. wait, sorry, he, he got suspended because why? So Calvin Ridley was a, he's now plays for the Jaguars. But while he was with the Falcons. He was on by and he was in Florida. I, th- I believe he's from Florida. And there was a two week period going back two years ago where sports betting was operating in Florida from your phone. And he just happened to be there at that time. And he put in a few bets. I think a few of them were on the Falcons. He came out and said that he was only betting $1,500 only relative. Um, he was betting around $1,500 and he got pinged by whoever that operator was came back his social security number or his name or his address. That information goes back to the NFL. The NFL suspended him. Well, by the way, just to be clear, what is the NFL's rule regarding gambling by players? So you can, if you're an NFL player, you cannot bet on the NFL. End of sentence. You cannot bet on any sport from the team facility. That includes practice facility. That includes the stadium. That includes the parking lot of the practice facility or the t- or the stadium. You can, however, if you're an NFL player, you can, however, bet on the NBA at, at the privacy of your own home or a restaurant or a bar. And, so, uh, and apparently the punishment for violating this is a one-year suspension? You are found guilty of bet- betting on the NFL as an NFL player. It's a one-year suspension. Actually, it's not even one-year suspension. It's you're on the commissioner exempt list, and then he determines – when you are allowed to be reinstated. Calvin Ridley example was a one-year suspension. 
Wow. There's an example of the Detroit Lion player, Jameson Williams. He was betting on other sports, not the NFL, not on the Lions, other sports, but he was doing it from inside, I, I, I think, either the weight room or the locker room or somewhere in the Lions facility. That is also not allowed. He was suspended well, six games that then got reduced to four games. And there have mm-hmm. been some other players uh, uh, in the last few months, a few players from the Colts, a few, a few, a few different players from the Lions that all. So got- those are those are very tough rules, which is great. But of course, the way that that point shaving would normally work is there's some bookie paying the guy to to do it. So he, it's not him putting his own money on it; it's just him getting paid so other people can put money on it. And I I do think that's inevitable. Whether or not, when, not if, when we find out. So in other words, if there was a point shaving scandal in week. We're going into week 11 of the NFL season. In week 11, we might not find out find out about it until a month from now, a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. I don't know when, but there. I don't know. It's not an if. It's a matter of when. There will be a point-shaving scandal, whether it's the NFL, NBA, college basketball, college football, MLB. When it, there's too much money uh, at, at stake to, to avoid it. Now, for college, the concern was for so many years, well, college players are going to be more success, successful – to point shaving scandals because they don't get paid. Well, NIL changed all that. So now they're on the same kind of playing field in terms of vulnerability uh, for point shaving as NFL or any professional player. Yeah. Yeah. They get paid less. So they're, they're more susceptible, but, but yeah, I get your point. The, the I, people of course out there is referees, as we mentioned, because they don't get paid as much. And so they become more susceptible. Referees are certainly among the big, probably the most uh, quarterback in the NFL pitcher in major league baseball referee in any sport yeah especially most- since you can at least in the super bowl you can bet on how many penalties there will be in the super bowl i don't know if you can do that in a regular season game but uh if, if you're one of the refs all you got to do is throw a couple extra flags and <laughs> to cover the over on that yeah and, and and i just think there's too much money either to be made or people get into too much trouble and they find this as a solution to help get them out of that hole yeah all right, Bill, enjoyed it. Where should people find you? Uh, you can find all my work at Sports Illustrated, SI.com. All right, Bill Enright, Managing Editor of Sports Betting for SI. Thanks so much for coming on the program, and thank you all for watching and listening to Double Down with Presslow. We'll be back soon with another episode. Take care, everybody. I want you to smash that like button. <laughs> 